So I guess it's time to start. Oh, let's see here. Uh, I'm I'm sorry, I'm trying to get my slide projection uh, going here. Okay, this is just a slide to show. Yes, I, I was buggering it up. Um, to show the anatomy that we're going to be discussing, we have the oral cavity here. That's the tongue, teeth and appendages, floor of mouth. And the pharynx begins at the anterior pillar of fauces. I guess in this particular um, slide, um, they're indicating the palatine tonsil, which is a typical thing that gets taken out in tonsillectomy as this yellowish blob there on the side. They seem to be pointing that as, oh, I, I guess here, this is what they're trying to say is palatine tonsil. This is my neighborhood in a way, and I think this slide is, uh, it's hard to depict this kind of thing. There is a structure which uh, is worth knowing about, and they're called Waldire's ring. It's an anatomical and histological configuration of lymphoid tissue that circles the pharynx. And the nasopharynx which is above the soft palate and behind the posterior aspect of the septum, also known as the epipharynx. Off the roof is a clump of adenoid or lymphoid tissue called the adenoid or epi of pharyngeal tonsil. And then the oral pharyngeal tonsils include the palatine tonsil. And on the back third of the tongue is a mass of tissue, which is called the lingual tonsil. This is pertinent to my discussion. And um, there's some lateral strands in the nasopharynx, which kind of complete the ring. Then um, the oral pharynx, think of the oral pharynx as what you can see when you look with a tongue depressor pushing the, at the very back of the throat. The nasopharynx is above the soft palate and the hypopharynx is the part of the throat intimately associated with the larynx. If you take a plane, there's a cricoid cartilage here, which is um, really important if you ever had to open the airway. Um, you have thyroid cartilage, and the Adam's apple is the uh, prominent in the uh, junction in, in front of the two thyroid cartilage ala. And below it is this little bump, which is the cricoid cartilage. If you absolutely had to, you could enter the airway through this thyrocricoid membrane in the very front with a pen, with a knife and a ballpoint pen, take the ballpoint out and you could put the tubular thing in there and blow into it to get air. Um, but normally you make a tracheostomy down here in the, like the second uh, ring. But if you take a plane right below the cricoid cartilage and thyroid cartilage there, this portion below would be esophagus, it'd be cervical esophagus, and this portion above that would be the hypopharynx, or lower pharynx. And um, if you do a laryngectomy, where someone has cancer of the larynx and has to have the larynx removed, and you take away all the structure, including the entire um, cricoid, cartilage. It's sort of signet ring shaped. That's the back part of it uh, right there. Um, it's tall in the back and the uh, retinoid cartilage is set on top of it. When you take that away, the pharynx is wide open and you close it in a T, sutures, and um, then let it heal for a week, 10 days. At any rate, um, I think it helps to understand nasal cavity, oral cavity, pharynx, and larynx. Pharynx and larynx and oral cavity and nasal cavity make 
the aerodigestive tract. So that's where we're going to be looking at slides from that area. I wanted to talk about a couple of other things real quickly. Uh, one is uh, the age old question, what is life? Uh, living organisms are cellular. Basically, they are cellular. They're contained structures and uh, have a defining membrane. Membranes can vary. Um, within those membranes, they maintain their own little uh, environment, um, which is called homeostasis, that maintain balance of um, all the biochemical processes and carry out metabolism in which they seek out energy or find energy opportunistically and utilize it and grow and do what is required to have a life cycle and reproduce and um, course of it they evolve. And I threw this in just to, uh, for heuristic purposes, really. Uh, the um, uh, mnemonic device uh, you might want to use if you never memorized one is um, uh, what I would suggest is Deum. King Philip came over from Great Spain. And G for Great and S for Spain is the genus species uh, designation that uh, is g typically used in describing organisms, the genus being capitalized. And um, normally both are either underlined or uh, italics. Um, DEUM, uh, D, uh, stands for domain. There's three domains. This, is represent this slide is representing eukaryotic cells uh, or organisms that have cells that have organelles and a nuclear membrane. This guy is Carl Woese. Woese, but they would have said Woese. Uh, this is from 1982 and the uh, uh, Charlie Vosprink was kind enough to allow me to use this slide. Um, and it, uh, uh, Shows a man who has been uh, under noticed, in my opinion. He never won the Nobel Prize. I think he got the MacArthur Prize. What he did was um, sort of out of the box, and it was absolute heresy at the time, the ideas he came up with. Uh, people considered there were two basic um, tree uh, branches in the tree of life. They were prokaryotes and uh, eukaryotes. And uh, uh, he realized based on sequencing RNA in um, replicative machinery, which he thought would be similar between related species, um, which was quite a good guess, uh, an educated guess. Uh, he uh, associated uh, organisms uh, and, and developed phylogeny based on uh, similarity of sequencing, similarity of, of replicative, replicative uh, uh, strategies and RNA sequences in, in ribosomes. Now, there are bacteria of a sort called archaea, which are quite ancient, probably the first forms of life on Earth, as everyone is thinking these days. Uh, this is, uh, I thought, was a nice picture, Loki's castle, uh, it's, uh, where research is being done to try to find uh, samples of archaea, which might be the uh, missing link, in a sense. Luca, the last universal common ancestor. If you look at the tree of life, that was archaeotype bacteria, which then had bacteria branch off, uh, bacteria meaning prokaryotes, which um, have distinctions from the archaea. Um, they uh, both have uh, um, 
uh, chromosomes floating in the uh, cyt uh, cytoplasm and such, but uh, and neither have organelles, but the ribosomes in the archaea are much more closely related to eukaryotes, which uh, of course have cellular membranes and were later, we are all eukaryotes uh, with our organelles and uh, chrom chromatin in a, in a um, nucleus that's bound by a membrane on, on except in mitosis. And uh, uh, something that's really interesting in this is that there is, um, this goes a bit beyond Darwin. In a sense, I think of Wolf's as a bit like Darwin. Um, there is this endosymbiotic evolution, uh, uh, symbi endosymbiotic revolutionary uh, evolutionary process uh, in which it's felt that maybe larger uh, archaea swallowed up smaller bacteria or archaea and um, in, for food and uh, likely. And as it turned out, that uh, was um, symbiotic or mutualistic relationship. And those uh, ingested bacteria and became organelles. That is where your mitochondria and where chlorophylls and plants are felt to uh, originate. And this is, uh, I just like this slide, it shows uh, size relations uh, and down uh, one micrometer is bacteria with similar sized mitochondria which have a double membrane and cristae and uh, membrane bound enzymes and, uh, and intermembrane space and then uh, space in the uh, between the cristae which are these little septae or divisions in the mitochondria uh, they have their own DNA and they have their own ribosomes. Uh, and they divide. You get all your mitochondria from your mother. And uh, so it's the source of internal language. Um, it's also is interesting. It shows that uh, the naked eye can uh, only see to about a tenth of a millimeter uh, or a hundredth of a millimeter, I guess. Um, but uh, uh, with a light microscope, you can see down to 100 nanometers. Not very well in my experience, but uh, maybe someone with super sharp eyes could. Uh, and flu viruses, for instance, or viral particles are tending to get into that area. It seems to me that tobacco mosaic virus is potentially visible by a light microscope, but it's definitely seen in uh, on microscopy, which can go down to atomic levels a little bit more. Uh, this is my self-indulgent slide. This is a, just a picture from a book chapter I wrote in 1993 for a medical textbook, and it shows a variety of viruses that can affect the aerodigestive tract aerodigestive tract being the throat, cavity, nasal cavity, and uh, where air and food go. Once you get to the esophagus, it's digestive tract, and once you get to the trachea, it's respiratory tract. Another aspect of this that's really interesting is uh, you look at how technology comes along uh, following discovery of uh, pure physics or like Rinken uh, discovering uh, x-rays in uh, uh, 1895 led to x-ray diffraction being uh, quite applicable by 1912. And Rosalind Franklin employed it for uh, figuring out that uh, the DNA uh, crystallinized as well as it could be was a double helix which Watson and Crick didn't understand squat about what she said, except that, hey, it's a double helix. So they took that and made their model with a few uh, guesses playing with paper. Uh, 
nuclear magnetic resonance as a quantum uh, uh, property of matter can be exploited with uh, uh, algorithms for uh, positioning and uh, and scanning with a gradated uh, magnetic field to make uh, images which can be quite detailed and uh, uh, it's used for figuring out molecules as well but uh, the first electron microscope was produced in 1933 in Germany. Uh, interestingly it uh, followed uh, this period of 1925 to 1927 when Heisenberg was thinking about the possibility of a gamma microscope as a thought experiment. Um, so it was actually invented, I guess, 31, and then it started to be used to, after that. And uh, uh, they started trying to make, th that was a transmission electron microscope. They tried to make uh, scanning electron microscopes after that. Uh, still in wartime, interestingly. And uh, in 1981, a scanning tunneling microscope uh, emerged. And um, I think the, I was thinking it was 93, but it's 1986 that the uh, um, inventors of that um, got the Nobel Prize. It opened up uh, immense opportunities in learning new things to image um, uh, small things uh, better than uh, transmission or scanning electron microscopy could do. Now a new technologies emerged in uh, 2017. Um, uh, it led to the Nobel Prize for three individuals that helped develop it. It's cryo-electron microscopy. And in that, you super cool uh, samples so the water doesn't freeze but becomes vitrified. You think of vitrification. You think of clay being fired and turned into glassy substance. Um, anyway, it was a marvelous way to examine specimens and not destroy them. Uh, it's the conditions for which one has to uh, expose samples to uh, visualize them in electron microscopy traditionally had been really harsh and destructive, uh, tailed a vacuum and other things. And uh, this preserves the structure and pretty much exactly what molecules are doing at the time they are, I'll just say frozen, frozen in place. So this has opened up a great line of research. I really, I wanted when I was young to build my own electron microscope. Actually, I, I didn't do it, but I was thinking of it. Uh, and uh, if someone is interested, uh, or you have a student who's interested, uh, this is the micro or the molecular biology age since DNA was defined in terms of structure and all the discoveries since. The greatest things that are going to happen in medicine in this century are going to be based on molecular biology. And if you want to be in something, be in something that's a happening field and uh, encourage your students uh, or young people to learn everything they can about molecular biology. And if they got, and, and or cell biology, they're really inseparable. At one point I, I wanted to quit medicine and just go work getting a PhD in virology which would be related to cell biology and molecular biology. But um, at any rate, that would be a really cool thing to do. Yeah, I guess uh, uh, enormous advances are being made with optics in all fields. Now, David Baltimore is a professor emeritus at the California Institute of Technology. He's a remarkable, um, uh, quiet individual who um, was a co 
discover independently of uh, reverse transcriptase or uh, uh, RNA transcriptase so that uh, retroviruses can convert their RNA to DNA, which was um, uh, considered heresy at the time it was proposed. Uh, somewhat the way Carl Woese was uh, considered to be heretical in what he was proposing and he was ignored by a lot of people. But at any rate, I will make this available and I, I meant to put this out at the very beginning, I kind of forgot. Uh, here is a link of all my slides. It's a shareable link and so um, anyone's welcome to take all this and I'm going to pass through some of this quickly, but if you want to go back and look at it, uh, um, um, well, it's an interesting point and uh, you know how science becomes dogmatic. You know, and, um, Boltz, Boltzmann committed, I don't like to say committed suicide because that's, you commit crimes and you end yourself by suicide. He took his own life because he felt all was lost because Mach and others were scornful of his arguments of the atomic theory. And maybe he had a penchant for depression without being able to fight it. Uh, whatever any one person uh, embraces can become like a religion to them. Overall, science is a consensus observation based uh, uh, human progress, uh, progressive um, process uh, should not be religious. <laughs> At any rate, what I want to point out is that Baltimore, sort of like Wolf looked at replicated replica, replica, strategies for rep, replication of uh, organisms and um, the similarities in the uh, RNA in ribosomes to organize uh, a phylogeny, a tree of life, into three domains. Baltimore. Uh, classified uh, viruses into se seven classes and the class I want to focus on today is class one. Uh, human papillomavirus is a class one double strand DNA virus and it's not too pretty. Let's see. There's my link again. I meant to, I had to, I have to put in the command for my slide to advance. Oh, I'm sorry, I did it wrong. Um, uh, da, da, da. <laughs> sorry. Okay. So this is just a summary slide to describe some aspects of human papillomavirus, HPV. Um, they're small viruses. They have basically eight re reading frames and in a sense they can produce a couple of extra products but uh, sort of by reading in the middle of a frame and some splicing and they have special functions but uh, the main ones I'm going to talk about. I'm not going to get into the other two but uh, eight reading frames, about 8,000 base pairs. Um, and they bind to histones or these protonaceous uh, spools for DNA in the nucleus of um, uh, eukaryotes that they attack, uh, which they target. They don't have an envelope. Uh, they are like a postcard, you might think. Um, Viruses that have an envelope, um, there are viruses with single strand DNA uh, and double stranded RNA. Uh, but anyway, uh, viruses that have an envelope uh, don't produce those themselves. It, they, they basically borrow those as they extrude from a cell. They take a piece of the cell membrane, wrap, wrap it around themselves like a cloak and they have these little spicule, spires that's of uh, ends of proteins that uh, 
uh, stick through by which they can find their next host cell or by which immune cells might find them and destroy them. At any rate, um, the human papillomavirus basically has eight genes. There are 50% of the genome is in these six early bio, viral genes, the E genes, E for early, E1, e 2, 4, 5, 6, 7. And these um, uh, people that write these papers don't know how to count. <laughs> and uh, an important aspect of this oncogenic um, uh, products are made from E5, E6, and E7, viral oncogenes, which can get taken up by uh, the host DNA and alter them so they become immortal. They transform um, sometimes to malignant uh, cells. A good example of that sort of malignant transformation is um, what you might have heard of a cell from a, a deceased patient named Henrietta Lake called the HeLa cell, which is in thousands of laboratories across the world uh, uh, since um, at least 70 years. Um, it's uh, a lot of research has been based on what the HeLa cells were doing in cooperation with the researcher. About 40% of the uh, genome is in uh, the production or involves the production of two late proteins or proteins that go into making the capsid. Now virus is a Latin word or uh, comes from a Latin word for poison um, and the capsid is like a container box. Um, and capsomeres are subunits of capsids. The um, L1 and L2 proteins are eight products. L1 is 70% of what is formed, and it forms the outside of the capsid, and therefore it's the one that's important immunogenically. When these, uh, it's something you can do, uh, make, uh, recombinant DNA uh, uh, strategies of taking the DNA from virus, that, that snippet that would make L1 proteins, um, introducing it into the genome of yeast. The yeast will make L1 proteins. You sacrifice the yeast and harvest all of these L1 um, proteins in fairly pure form. They will self-assemble. 72 capsum box and which is pretty cool I think that um, I've also read about uh, they have uh, potential energy by which they spring open um, that they kind of steal from the cell I don't understand the energetics of that and I I, I just mentioned it uh, um, but um, uh, something would have to reverse it to let the uh, genome out. These boxes contain the uh, the bad stuff that uh, really gets you sick. Uh, this is an example of what can be displayed by using cryo electron microscopy and uh, imaging techniques and algorithms on the data used to um, produce um, digital images. They're far better and considered far more valid than uh, any images that can be obtained by analog procedures like transmission electron microscopy. These are not really uh, icosahedrons. That always confused me. They would show these and I'm, I'm mathematical and I think of uh, icosahedrons as icosahedrons icosahedral like uh, if you look here that is surrounded by six units if you look here that's surrounded by five units it's not a it's not a uniform uh, uh, perfect icosahedron it made me think of a soccer ball but uh, it's I think it's distinct from that as well but uh, 
because uh, it has ends up with 72 capsomeres. So <clears throat> I wanted to review quickly um, the uh, early pro early vir uh, viral genes. Um, uh, and I don't want to go into too much detail about this, uh, but just to let you know what they do. Um, <clears throat> E1 proteins, um, they um, bind to um, DNA and uh, they, in, in uh, the virus, and, and assemble into hexameric uh, helicases with the, of the second viral protein. Uh, now, I think when this starts off, it, it's using the um, cells equipment. The uh, HPV virus uh, uh, replication takes place in the nucleus. The virus gets uh, into the cell and the uh, genome of the virus gets to the nucleus and uh, it starts off uh, slowly and then uh, after a point the virus itself is able to take off. But these helicases, a helicase is an enzyme or active enzyme that will unravel DNA. And uh, once you have E1 and E2 proteins being uh, produced, you can make these helicases that will uh, speed up the production of the HPV virus. Um, <clears throat> now the E4 gene it really is taken out of a central portion of um, the E2 gene. It, uh, it's an open reading frame uh, within that, uh, that portion of the gene. And it gets spliced with um, uh, some of the beginning of the E1. So you have this E1 splice E4 uh, 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 string. Uh, that uh, uh, really uh, starts to increase when the virus is getting amplified uh, and uh, starting to produce on its own, having kind of borrowed from the cell's resources at first. Uh, the um, fact that it grows in its quantity at this point uh, means that it becomes a molecular marker for HPV infection. I'm going to have some pictures before long, so don't get, don't, don't tune out. Uh, that's the only go, there's, and there's only uh, six of these early genes, and I talked a little bit about the L1 and L2. So anyway, the E1 and E4 is most abund abundantly expressed viral protein when uh, HPV virus is up and running uh, and getting itself going. Uh, now, it talks some in a bit about how skin matures from basal cells to keratin. And in the skin, um, like ordinary wart uh, can bind to this cytokeratin, which is a keratin is like the same kind of protein it's made of. Dry, water repellent aspect of your skin is due to keratin. Um, Posa in your throat and those in the vagina and such do not have keratin. Um, uh, and, um, or in the cervix anyway. Uh, uh, anyway, it can collapse the cytokeratin network. It, it uh, really disrupts the cell and there's uh, an interesting aspect. It locks it into uh, a G2 phase uh, of the cell cycle. And it also can prolong the S phase of the cell cycle. Um, so, uh, and it can bind to proteins in the mitochondria in one article. Now, I'm not sure what the significance of that is, but it's, it is interesting it, uh, that uh, stuff's all over the cell. This is a slide I found on the street. <laughs> uh, it was a work of art, I must say. Interface, I want to re uh, just mention here, uh, uh, this will be available uh, 
through uh, that link I gave. Uh, it has a lot of information. If you had all the information of this in your mind, uh, you have a pretty good uh, perspective on cell cycle. Um, but the G2, you know, cells grow. That's one of the aspects of life. And uh, G1 and G2 phases are both growth phases. Um, G1 phase, after after you have the separation of the DNA, nuclear division, you have cytokinesis where the cytoplasm divides and um, have energy molecules pull a waste in, just like it starts to look like a figure eight and the cell begins to constrict with a cleavage furl and two cells finally are after completion of that process. So that's the cytokinesis part of cell division. Then you got two smaller cells that have their fair share of Golgi processes and the plasmic reticulum. Another interesting thing is when the nuclear membrane breaks down at the beginning of process, it vesiculates, it forms little bubbles and these all get separated pretty evenly and then um, contribute to forming new mu nuclear membranes in each new cell. It's, it's really absolutely fascinating process. It's M phase of mitosis. Um, but at any rate, uh, in the G1 phase, these little cells that just got their daughter cells, they start to grow. Uh, the S phase uh, is where chromosomes are uh, S for synthesis. Um, that means the cell is going to go, but um, plenty of times they go into a G zero phase while or G zero cells, uh, ex examples of cells that go permanently in G zero phases are red blood cells, which are uh, denucleate. Mature red blood cells don't have nuclei. It's G0 phase. Neurons are um, um, stable cells that no longer divide, and cardiac muscle is another one. Uh, you start to uh, damage your cardiac muscle. Uh, you got to be careful, you'll be screwed. You don't get any more of it unless you get lucky and get an expensive operation. I'm not sure it's lucky. Uh, anyway, uh, the viral genes E5, E6, and E7 are, are really important in terms of uh, serious disease because those can become uh, taken up by the um, uh, genome of the host and change it forever. Um, the uh, E5, I was saying, uh, slows the differentiation of uh, skin cells from basal cells to the corny cells, which I'll show you in a minute, uh, which benefits the virus by giving it more time to produce more virons. Um, and uh, if it's going into lysogeny, which means it's producing virons, it's going to kill the cell and spew them out. Um, uh, or, or the lysis stage, rather. Uh, lysogeny is when it's sitting with the virus in it. Uh, uh, but uh, at any rate, the, uh, there's an E3 um, spliced uh, type of uh, product that I'm not going to get into, but it has something to do with controlling a uh, number of viron uh, particles that are in the cell and how the cell proceeds uh, once it's been taken over. I made a little joke before the uh, virus, once it gets in there and gets a hold of the DNA, it's like emoluments. Uh, it starts to uh, manipulate the cell for its own good, its own future and wealth, uh, rather than for the good of the cell. Uh, funny how everything's sort of like, else. 
Anyway, these early viral genes uh, continuing E6 and E7 uh, stimulate production of proteins that are required for synthesis and uh, get it get the cells into uh, S phase and then able to proliferate. But more ominously, they can inactivate uh, tumor repress a tumor suppressor p53 and the retinoblastoma prb retinoblastoma tumor suppressor proteins so they can subvert i'm going to show in the end of this uh, talk how they do this in a sense they subvert the um, justice system of the cell that is intended to keep them from taking over dictating what happens in the cell uh, against the best interests of the cell. Oh, what metaphors. Okay. I want to talk some about uh, vaccines. Um, this was a slide from the NIH, or National Institutes of Health, which I uh, urge everyone to look to as a quality source. One of the great achievements of government in the world for the good of humanity. But, uh, DNA vaccine uh, efforts uh, were pushed by people at Johns Hopkins. I mentioned the researchers here. They focused on HPV-16. There were over 150 stra uh, strains or types of HPV virus um, uh, known. Um, 16 and 18 are two types that are responsible for 70% of cervical cancers. Um, throw in uh, not just 16 and 18, but also type 31, you're talking about 90% of the cervical cancers are caused by those viruses. Um, like the HeLa cell. Uh, offhand, I can't tell you which, which one the, uh, the HeLa cell was from, but probably one of those. It was quite an aggressive tumor she had. At any rate, uh, I wanted to mention this. There was uh, a lot of work also done in, by uh, people in Australia, the United States, and England to develop the first vaccines. Um, in 2006, with about 20 of development and discovery enabled this, including ways to uh, do recombinant DNA, whereby you take the gene and incorporate it, uh, just the single gene, not the whole genome, that is responsible for something that would be antigenic, and, and put it in the yeast genome, and um, the yeast will produce L1 proteins for you, and you isolate those by purification methods uh, from the yeast, and um, which can be quite pure. Um, and you're not having to remove any viruses, you're just removing it from cellular components. Uh, and um, those L1 um, products uh, will um, and have this done for each time. You don't have the same one um, section from all these types into the same batch. You do this in different batches, so it's uh, so it's nice and neat. Uh, for any one of those, you isolate the L1 proteins, and they self-assemble, self-assemble to uh, virus-like particles, the LP, it's called. And using this kind of um, approach, um, uh, Merrick. Uh, was the first to market um, uh, and get a, get approved and market um, Gardasil, which had these four types of uh, HPV virus covered. Now, type six and type eleven are um, they can cause malignant transformation, but more commonly they're associated with um, genital warts and condyloma cumulata, which is a uh, ward in the uh, pretty gross in the cervix, vagina, vulva, and also rectum and anus. 
and uh, uh, penile cancers and anal uh, rectal cancers uh, have a high association with HPV virus. Uh, 16 and 18 are two of the big problems for causing cervical cancer. And they also can cause head and neck cancer because of uh, basically direct contact and exposure. Um, yeah, I'm letting people's imagination run wild with my presentation. Just as a historic note, in 2009, Cervarex, um, uh, GlaxoSmithKline um, produced Cervarex, which was uh, uh, a bit different uh, from um, uh, Gardasil. Uh, so they weren't equivalent and interchangeable, meaning if you're giving, you know, normally when, like with the current uh, Gardasil 9, it's a non avalent or nine different antigenic types are covered by the current only available Gardasil 9, which is Merck. Uh, but you give the you give a dose and then at six months or so you give the second dose and a third dose at about a year. And um, uh, there is uh, some potential strategy for giving two doses, but if you give it less than six months apart, you have to do something more. Um, let's see, a question. If the virus inserts itself in the DNA, does it tend to do so in active areas? Do they stimulate transcription? Um, yes, they, well, they have to expose, they have to have exposed DNA to, they, they, uh, uh, I think that they would have to get inserted where um, the DNA is not wrapped around a histone. And yes, then that um, stretch of virus gets actively transcribed. Um, and it gets transcribed as uh, to make messenger RNA just as the, uh, in uh, reading the negative sense uh, strand of DNA after it gets unwound just like ordinary DNA does. And yes, I'm talking basically about uh, pharyngeal, laryngeal cancers, and I'm talking about head and neck cancers, uh, not skin cancers there. Um, thank you for the questions. Uh, so uh, anyway, Cervarex went to a lot of trouble, uh, 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 um, GSK went to a lot of trouble producing uh, Cervarex. It's a competitive field, uh, expensive to do research and develop this and then to go through all these trials and it was effective uh, and it didn't catch on and they gave up. Uh, in 2016, they, they sacked it, which I thought was kind of interesting. And so, uh, I, I wanted to add in 2010, uh, Gardasil was uh, approved by the FDA or Federal Drug Administration in the uh, United States for prevention of anal cancer and associated precancerous lesions due to HPV 6, 11, 16, and 18. Sorry, I just hit my microphone. Uh, waving my arms around. I'll let you just imagine that. Um, at any rate, um, for anal cancers and precancerous lesions due to these four types of viruses that Gardasil, the original Gardasil covered uh, in patients uh, nine to 26 years. Now, currently the uh, recommendations are for nine to 40, nine years old to 45 years old uh, to get the vaccination. And um, usually three, for complete uh, uh, coverage uh, as well as it's going to be. There's no guarantee that any one person getting any vaccine is going to be safe completely from the um, uh, uh, agent that's being worked on because there's a lot of things that could, could go wrong. If for some reason the specimen, uh, the, the sample, the um, 
uh, substance that sat too long and become inactive, or if they don't shake it up, and it's a suspension. You got to shake it up and get it mixed up nicely to get the uh, uh, mixture right. And um, uh, if the person's own immune system doesn't respond to it, and uh, so it's not an agent that works by itself. It works by uh, it's a heads up for your immune system for um, here's what's coming. So this is one reason why they're recommending this uh, be given to children age 11 before they're sexually active. And mentioned in the earlier discussion, I think it's worth saying is um, from my experience, I think there's so many cases where uh, children are abused uh, sexually by someone in the household, uh, sometimes a boyfriend or uh, someone who's not a blood relative, but uh, who's predatory, and um, it's probably worth considering that uh, children younger than 11 be given this kind of protection because it, if you get it before you get exposure, and it works if enough people get the um, get the vaccine so that the virus doesn't have any place to leap to person to person. Herd immunity, yes. Now, um, Articil 9, it's a non-avalent or nine different antigenic uh, um, types are covered. These, these, these nine different types of HPV. Uh, again, six, six and 11 are for genital and anal warts and uh, condyloma cumulata of the vulva and that sort of thing, the vulva being part of the vagina. And um, type 16 and 18 and 31 are treacherous, uh, associated 90% of the cervical cancers in women, uh, of which 400, I think 400 uh, million die yearly of that. Uh, I believe that's about right. Um, and then there's also um, other uh, 33, 45, 52, 58, all those are associated with cancers. And I took this NIH poster, which I thought was quite interesting and might be uh, uh, something to keep in mind that people that just receive one dose are of, of an HPV vaccine have 88% lower infection with HPV in the oral pharyngeal cavity. Uh, about 150 types of HPV are known, uh, actually a, a bit more than that, but um, they're not all human um, hosts uh, for that. There are HPV in the um, zoonoses. You find them in uh, um, mammals, uh, like rabbits that have HPV viruses all over their nose and things like that. It's hanging down. Okay. Um, so now Gardasil since 2017 is the only show in town. And uh, I think it's uh, interesting to note that there appears to be some cross coverage. There is um, some protection against, suggested by research, against um, uh, viruses of other types based over, uh, based on maybe um, molecular similarity. Uh, I guess that's right. Um, well, there's papillomaviruses in the animals. I think there are 150 human virus, uh, HPV. So um, I'm, I'm glad you point that out. I, I think that there's there's a lot more out there, but I, I think there's a great number of uh, variants that attack humans or that use humans as hosts. So, um, People who shouldn't get it, uh, someone who's ever had uh, anaphylaxis to a vaccine, which is not common, but it's life-threatening if it occurs, and uh, anyone giving a vaccine should be uh, able to administer uh, 
uh, countermeasures in the case of anaphylaxis, which is basically epinephrine and prednisone uh, injected. Uh, pregnancy. I, I told a long story. I won't go back through now uh, about a guy uh, getting into a potential ruckus with some uh, other guys that thought they were tough, and he went up to them and uh, uh, said, you want it all at once or one at a time? And these guys who had been provoking a problem said, uh, we don't want no trouble, man. And uh, basically, that's probably a good philosophy of life. Uh, if you've got somebody who's pregnant, they've got enough going on. And anything you do, if anything changes or any unexpected outcomes uh, happen, uh, everybody would be wondering if it were the vaccine. So basically, you, you just don't give it to the vaccine it, uh, to, to a pregnant uh, female. Uh, it's not expected it would have any effect uh, particularly, but um, it, it, uh, there's no reason to take a chance. Somebody who's, who's already ill with something, their immune system's probably challenged a bit, so shouldn't have it. An exception might be HP, HIV or something like that when they're in between, or someone with uh, leukemia. Now, there have been all kinds of, um, oh, there's local reactions to the shot, and there's fainting, and uh, I don't know, I, a lot of um, typical stuff. Uh, I told a story this morning. I had a big brawny guy one time in my office, and I examined his ear under the microscope, operating a, a uh, you know clinical microscope, like a field microscope. And uh, afterwards, I was sitting there looking at him talking, and he got glazed over. This was within a couple minutes after finishing looking at his ear. I hadn't done much, um, and. I thought, this guy's not there. And he just had a glassy look, and he suddenly started to fall forward like a tree falling in a forest. So I dove under him and uh, landed on my knee and caught him on my shoulder so he didn't smash onto the floor and uh, called for help. As I couldn't get out, I was in a position where I, I couldn't easily stand up without possibly dropping him. Uh, I mean, people faint all the damn time when they're, they get vasovagal responses. You don't know who's going to do it. And uh, so getting that in response to a shot doesn't surprise me. But uh, this slide just describes a couple of uh, issues that had been uh, brought up as potential claims against, uh, as, as reactions to the vaccine. And um, basically, um, the uh, EMA, or European Medi uh, Medicines uh, Agency, uh, concluded that uh, the casual there's no casual link between these vaccines, any of them, and the development of these sorts of conditions. This is kind of typical. Uh, I won't go on about that particularly. I want to talk a bit about, wow, I, I need to speed up. Um, I looked at the time. Uh, some uh, the five layers of the skin. The basal layer is where it all starts. Those are the cells that replicate to reproduce cells that are being uh, going through differentiation and sloughing finally at the layer, which is at the bottom here. Um, the spiny layer is um, where the cells uh, go from being sort of uh, cuboidal and plump to being uh, uh, sort of speculated and stretched out, and that's uh, probably the strongest layer of any of these. Then this granulosum layer is, uh, or granular layer, is where the um, uh, keratin granules are being formed, and it's uh, that's where those get disrupted by one of those early genes, um, and the whole network of them. And it uh, tends to arrest development so that this uh, the virus gets to produce itself longer. Then you get uh, loss of nucleus, and uh, the st cells sort of start to look lucid or clear. And then finally, you have this keratin-packed dead cells. And keratin's what uh, makes hair, for instance. 
Uh, keratin makes the outside of the skin impermeable to water. Um, uh, uh, lipid soluble stuff will tend to get through. Acetone will get through. Uh, hepatotoxins and neurotoxins can get through the skin. So, you know, you're not off scot free, but your skin does a quite a good job for being the largest organ. But it gets little micro breaks all the time and has to repair itself. It repairs itself. There's a basement membrane here that separates the dermis from this layer of basal cells right there. And then um, you have the um, uh, spiny layer, which is the strength layer. And then this little darker band is the granular layer we start to have uh, keratin formed, then it gets clear, and then you got these stratified um, keratin-filled layers of dead skin. I think the integument, uh, meaning the uh, uh, skin as an organ, is is considered the largest. Is what I've always understood. This is just to illustrate um, the layers of the skin. This is not HPV. It's just a nice slide of skin. These are called ready pegs. They are sort of like anchors going down into the dermis. You have blood vessels and also fine nerves, uh, tactile nerves that are myelinated and autonomic nerves to the um, blood vessels that are unmyelinated down here in the dermis. You don't have any of those in the skin. Um, and you get thickened keratin layers and a thickened granular layer with this kind of condition. But I just wanted to show it because it was a nice slide of uh, skin showing another example, and albeit a, a normal skin condition, but not a, it's, it's an annoyance, it's itchy. Let's see here. Most of my slides now are going to be uh, clinical type slides. Uh, this is a close up of that one I, I just showed. So I'll keep going here. Okay, don't shake hands, bump elbows. Also shaking hands is the best way to get a cold. High efficiency uh, transmission. You can have cold viruses active still after three hours of dry dryness that's not that wasn't a, that was a wart what i just showed you uh cnn disagrees with me <laughs> well that's fake news i guess <laughs> uh and i'll have to check that out uh anyway um uh this is a common wart um uh Verrucus vulgaris, um, and you get a lot of hyperkeratosis or a lot of this um, uh, corny layer. It's real thickened, and uh, the granular layer right there gets thicker and more uh, active, and um, got long, ready uh, um, pegs, uh, and they interlock, which is kind of interesting. It helps to anchor the skin and cause it to be... Uh, Let's see. Um, well, I think that the realization that viruses were associated with uh, cervical cancer um, may date back to the 70s. Uh, I'd have to look that up to be sure. This is just a close up of the common wart and the ready pegs here. And there's the granular layer, the lucidum layer, and the spiny layer. This is where the virus is really taken off. It gets into the basal layer and it depends on cell maturation for its development. And if it can slow it down in this middle zone, it gets to, the virus gets to do more. Here's the uh, endocervix. This is the ectocervix and the endocervix. Uh, and this is the junction of those two cell types. And that is um, 
felt to be the most vulnerable uh, area for uh, HPV to get started. Hotspot, I guess. And you get it started and you get dysplasia and then uh, further changes that lead to cancer. Okay, these are some clinical slides. This is the endolarynx. Here's a vocal cord or a vocal fold. And there's the false cord there. And the ventricle is a little space there between the two. Um, here the vocal fold isn't too bad. It has sort of um, dilated blood vessels, but uh, shouldn't too unusual. But uh, this is all papillomavirus here and here and here. And there are different ways. I always took these off mechanically. Uh, I didn't like using laser on them. Uh, you get a plume. You, you here. This is the endotracheal tube. This is an operative um, uh, endoscopic view of the endolarynx. That's part of the endoscope, the steel endoscope right there. Uh, but if you use a laser, you have to have a guarded tube. If you don't, um, you can end up with the tube uh, catching on fire and, um, and um, um, uh, endotracheal fires were common, particularly in early laser surgery. Uh, you have to have a laser nurse in the, in the room. You have to have all this extra equipment. It takes a lot of space and it's a lot more complex. And the more complex it is, the more likely something's going to go wrong. Also, you get reflections of the um, uh, a laser beam off the metal or off the metal here if it's not aimed right you you calibrate it at the first and it can scatter and burn some stray area uh, so there's a lot more to worry about when you do laser ex extraction um, yeah if that happens you extra you pull the tube out uh, but you have a high level of oxygen going through these endotracheal tubes when people are asleep. This is more papillomavirus uh, caused tumor of the endolarynx. That's benign. Uh, there as well, right there, all that. That's fairly normal looking cord. That looks polypoid. It might have virus in it and eventually would look like this. It's hard to tell without testing it uh, sometimes, unless sometimes it's blatant like this. In this case, this is the front, and that's the posterior commissure, the endolarynx, kind of an inner space between the structures associated with the arytenoid cartilages, which move the cords uh, or close them. So it's kind of messy. And if this gets really advanced, uh, it can obstruct the airway. And um, here's another, um, it really could be polypoid uh, cords. Uh, I think that often a person with this appearance, if there was no history, would go to the operating room with uh, thought it was polypoid cords and uh, then you, my hospital tests all these uh, for HPV now. Uh, other things have been tried, like ultrasound, which was bogus. And uh, I was going to tell you that using the laser, there was with the plume of smoke, it can have viral particles. There was one guy in Boston I knew of who had a virus. Uh, a papilloma grow in the middle of his forehead, just below his surgical cap. Uh, he did a lot of these kinds of surgeries. Uh, so I never was too thrilled with. This is just uh, shows some of the artifact of doing video um, laryngoscopy in the office. But here's a better picture. This shows Beautiful, uh, beautifully normal larynx. That's the epiglottis. This is the front. That's the anterior commissure, the posterior commissure. True cord, that's the trachea down there. There's the false cord or plica ventricularis. And the ventricle is between these two structures. And this is the vestibule, area epiglottic fold. And the piriform sinus, when you swallow the uh, 
vocal folds close, the false chords or plica uh, ventricularis closes, and the epiglottis kind of goes down, the larynx gets pulled up, feel your throat and swallow and you'll feel your larynx pull up and it closes down like an accordion and that's an extrinsic sphincter mechanism to help protect the airway because if you have stuff you're trying to get to go down here down the gullet going down here very much you die that's aspiration you cannot have much aspiration and survive so when all that happens the larynx gets pulled up this piriform sinus here widens and the cricopharyngeus muscle in the back loosens and stuff the bolus runs through it goes through about 21 feet a second oh, pretty quick lickety split this is a vocal nodule uh, i was trying to remember it's like kenny rogers had these uh, singer um, julie andrews i think had them as well uh, singer's nodes they're called and um, as opposed to uh, polypoid chords, which is like a blues singer might have, um, like Janis Joplin or uh, James Brown. Uh, uh, singer's nodules really cause terrible dysphonia. You don't really want to hear what you're singing with that. And it would make it, make it worse. Now, if a baby is born through a birth canal that has papillomavirus in it and they aspirate some of the particles, viral particles or the virons, they can end up with it growing in their throat, especially on their larynx and their trachea. That's called juvenile laryngeal papillomatosis. And it, there are cases where it's taken over the trachea and the lungs and the had never had it clear up. They go into their 30s and die of cancer. That's been reported. Um, it's, uh, there's some success in treating that with interferon. Um, no, it's better to avoid this virus. Uh, that's more laryngeal papilloma there and there. That's epiglottis there again. In this case, that's epiglottis and the anterior cord is uh, there in the front. Uh, let's see. This is a papilloma on the, uh, attached to the uvula and the arch above the palatine tonsil and that that's after it was excised and i appreciate uh, dr kevin all sharing this slide with me uh so i have a whole lot of slides but they're buried in boxes uh so my house has been turned upside down Here's a microscopic of that uh, kind of uh, uvular papilloma, and it has all these fronds and such. Um, and you can see it's similar in its appearance, eosinophilic, meaning it's kind of pinkish with these blue areas uh, where you probably have basal cells. Uh, as similar to slides I showed of the skin, Here's another nasopharyngeal uh, papilloma, and that was excised. Those can be tough to get to. Uh, uh, often, if it's purely oropharyngeal, I would do an office procedure to remove it. And again, I don't like using laser. Uh, for a lot of people, laser is their favorite hammer. And people will go to somebody because they, oh, I hear they use laser, and they've got no clue about the amount of problem it can cause. They have a totally unschooled view of it and you can't tell them. They just think, oh, that's that's the cutting edge or something. Yeah. That's the way people. This could be just a papilloma. Uh, it turns out it's a cancer. This guy also had uh, smoking and alcohol uh, history, which is so not um, everyone who has uh, HPV just has uh, that as their uh, only risk factor. He also had a lung cancer from his smoking. This is the oral tongue. It's coated. Uh, these are vibrissae of the upper lip. <laughs> Any ideas what this thing is? Anyone? Euler? Ferris Bueller. 
That's a tongue cancer. That's a malignancy. That's the kind of thing that uh, I've dealt with a lot. You can actually take, uh, remove half the tongue and a person will still have adequate amount of tongue muscle for deglutition and articulation. And they'll be alive, able to taste. Oh, something as big as that, he would probably need radiation as well. Uh, this is a um, pathological slide of it. It comes, it's sort of lobulated. And the thing is with these uh, palatine tonsil cancers, uh, this is not that one I just showed you, but it's just an example of uh, cancer in their throat uh, from HPV. And um, basaloid is, is one variation that actually I've been seeing surprisingly more of in the past 10 years. Uh, it buries itself in all that lymphoid tissue. It doesn't grow exophytically or outward like a fungus, like uh, what I showed you on the tongue. And people often don't have too much in the way of symptoms. They might get ear pain because some of the same nerves, particularly glossopharyngeal cranial nerve, has branches to the middle ear. And um, they'll get ear pain. I had people that would come in with ear pain and I find they have a lump in their neck because these will have early metastases to lymph nodes in the neck. Sometimes they come in with just a neck mass and you can't find the tumor, no matter how hard you try. Um, positron emission tomography or PET scans have helped quite a lot in determining it. This is a close up of it. So I got over time, I want to keep going here real quick. I'll let you look at that in the handout if you want to see it more. Um, the cells have some innate immunity. Uh, you have also your specific immunity once you've had exposure, uh, but before that happens, you have naive cells. Um, particularly your ba uh, basal cells in your skin can um, elaborate uh, uh, cytokines and uh, things that promote inflammatory cells moving in um, to protect you. But so it's a two edged sword in a way. Uh, undifferentiated basal uh, keratinocytes um, are the primary target for skin infections of HPV. And mucosal infections, I think, are similar in this regard but they also have um, some resistance to uh, the infection. And sometimes that's not enough. There are dendritic cells, which I wanted to point out, uh, which move around and they are throughout all layers of skin and they uh, end up getting sloughed. But if they find um, uh, antigens that they don't like, they will process them and try to hand them off to immune cells and uh, activate your immune system, protect you, takes a week or two. This is from my um, uh, non-alcoholic uh, fatty liver disease talk, and it doesn't show, but you have, I just brought it back because you have dentate cells throughout the liver as well. And uh, they're, they're throughout the body. They're not just in the skin. Um, there was a medical student, Paul Langerhans, in 1868, who thought he was seeing nerve cells in the skin, but he was actually seeing these dendritic cells, uh, which are antigen presenting immune cells. Um, they're from a couple, there is a couple of sources for them, bone marrow and lymphoid. And uh, I just wanted you to be aware of them. Immunoperoxidase, immunoperoxidase stain helps to show these. And if you look, uh, I thought that this was pretty good. They sort of, they're sort of like an octopus. They have all little, all kinds of little strands coming out, they're like fingers reaching out. Uh, so um, these have what are called bareback bodies or Beerbeck granules, um, 
they were first described in 1961 and they're seen on electron microscopy, especially in the spiny layer of skin. Uh, something happened here. Uh, here we go. And uh, this is just a, a source for my next four slides. I just wanted to quickly show you, I love electron microscopy. Uh, nucleolus, nucleus, the nucleus is bound in a membrane and a eukaryotic cell. Mitochondria have a membrane and they have Christi. That's where cellular respiration takes place. You have the Golgi complex, trans-Golgi network, which produces endosomes, and you get lysosomes, which can be pushed off um, smooth plasmatic particular process that tend to have enzymes that will kill stuff. Uh, I'll just run through these because I want to show you some Bierbeck bodies. There's a second one that you can look at in more detail from the handout in the shareable link. There's a Bierbeck body. Here's a Bierbeck body. There's a Bierbeck body. Can't, I don't think you could really see that with a microscope. I've never seen one with a microscope, it, uh, a light microscope. There's one, and there's one. Sometimes they're a little bit like club-shaped. And um, so, continuing on, I'm almost done. But you get pattern recognition receptor cells, like the dentate cells. Uh, that can recognize things like the, an example of uh, one of the types of uh, uh, things that those cells can recognize are lipopolysaccharides of gram-negative bacteria. That is like the stuff that the dysbiosis or bad unfavorable bacteria in, the, in a disease microbiome uh, is producing all the time that gets absorbed into your portal circulation and percolates through the liver and, in, and damages your liver progressively until you get fatty change, possibly uh, inflammation and fibrosis, and then cirrhosis, uh, liver cancer. Um, so this is a major point I wanted to make. These undifferentiated basal cells, uh, keratinocytes, or just basal cells of the mucosa as well, um, are a primary target. And you have these danger sensing uh, immune cells, which helps clearance. And most of these types of viruses get cleared in a couple of years. But when they don't, you got a real problem. Um, Okay, I'm going to try to wrap it up here. So this is a busy slide, but it talks about growth factors, chemokines, and cytokines, uh, uh, molecules um, that uh, are secreted by the basal cells uh, to, as, as part of the in, in, innate immune system before you have, when you have a naive immune system, before it gets sensitized to a specific uh, uh, agent. In addition, some of these will suppress the growth of uh, of uh, HPV transformed keratinocytes. So um, another big point: E5, E6, E7 are oncogenic, meaning they can immortalize a cell or transform it lead to its transformation to a malignant cell. Malignancy means it can kill you. Benign means it's not going to kill you. That's that simple. Uh, E6 and E7 uh, also nefariously inactivate suppressor proteins like P53 and P retinoblastoma suppressor proteins. And this is an example, this ubiquitin ligase. Ligase to ligate means to bind together. It helps to bring together this viral protein, E6, to join up with this friendly um, host produced, sorry, I bumped my microphone, uh, P53 tumor suppressor 
molecule that helps you to not get cancers. It binds them, and when it does that, this assembly mark is marked for destruction. This is how E6, which is being produced in abundance by the virus um, subverting your um, uh, cells uh, uh, governs um, like a coup, uh, takes out the uh, justice system so that it can survive and become dictator. Here's a nice reference you might want to look at, and I want to point out once again that uh, National Library of, S of Medicine and the National Institutes of Health are a wonderful source of information. And I came across, I, I told this morning, uh, this is a uh, quote that was shared with me by a concert pianist in Brooklyn who's a recording artist. Uh, it's a friend of mine. I thought it was wonderful. Love this quote. And it uh, related to it. And what occurred to me, and I wrote this out, I'll just read it very quickly. It's something moving through a trajectory, trajectory of points over time can follow an infinite straight line. Just one of those points is not collinear, even by an infinitesimal amount, then the trajectory lies in a plane up if at least two other point such points in the continuous locus of points are not coplanar space curve in any case the complexity of one's destiny greater with small excursions from a predictable path in a sense any pursuit of free will that may be possible must entail seeking those small degrees of freedom from which divergence can arise opening up the unknown outcomes take note of any does not make perfect sense for it may be a person who can show way to all the others i really liked that i wrote that out to read to you as my response to this quote one last point i would make and i was very blunt about this this morning i think anyone who is a child and doesn't get the vaccinated against HPV by the age of 11 uh, is stupidly negligent. Um, I also pointed out your chance and you put your child on a bus in the morning to go to school. Uh, they're probably at greater risk for not being never ever able to come home from that than they would ever be at taking this vaccine. Uh, I'm emphasizing this because I wish that if you were prepared for it, if you could see the things I've seen, the suffering I've seen, the deaths, the things people go through, and some of it's because of new lifestyle things of, um, that aren't necessarily that new, but um, like anal sex and oral sex and those things. And uh, that's ubiquitous where sexual creatures, everybody's active at some point. Um, your children are going to be active. They're going to be exposed. Um, to get a rectal cancer and have it excised by an anterior posterior sec resection and have a colostomy, end up with liver disease uh, full of metastases sometimes anyway and dying from it or in nodules in the lungs, or cervical cancer it involves the colon and rectum, or radiation for it cleans the rectum and its function and its quality of life. And um, I go to tumor board on a weekly basis, and the urologists are very frequently presenting uh, cases of penile cancer, which are treated by partial amputation. Uh, and uh, aside from that, these head and neck procedures, of partial glossectomy, uh, laryngopharyngectomy, uh, sometimes requiring free flaps, pectoralis major, myocutaneous flaps, just to bring up enough tissue to reconstruct so they have a conduit through which they can swallow, uh, losing voice and 
much of the tissue in one side of the neck or both sides of the neck if they end up with bilateral radical neck dissections or the diffuse fibrosis of the neck from radiation therapy and the xerostomia, no saliva, miserable swallowing problems that are usually permanent. They might improve a bit over years and years, but all those along with the toxicity of chemotherapy, who would you wish that upon? Certainly not your children, not other people's children. So because some moron on the internet has some claim about vaccines, uh, people buy that. And it's the same way people are buying the um, bias uh, bought time of politicians over people that have spent their lives uh, studying. I don't think I said it in this session. I have no investments in any uh, in Gardasil or any of these pharmaceutical companies. I'm not invested in pharmaceutical companies. I'm not um, in any way uh, uh, benefiting from uh, promoting any particular uh, treatment or process uh, other than I'd like to see people do well and I like to see people being informed. I love science and I love teaching and want to share some of what I knew with you and I hope maybe you can share it with some others. And that's, that's the end of my talk. Thank you. Any any questions? Thank you, Shanta. Yeah, they vaccinate. Oh, I, I don't have anything planned. <laughs> Thank you, Dolly. But I have some ideas. It's unfair to the children, in my thinking. That's well put, Vic. Ideas of the seed of plans. The seeds of plans. Was it a better sound production with my headset? I bought a headset about a week ago. Terrific. Excellent. Was it not loud enough, Sergey? Synergy. Okay. Is that a question for me, Vic, or for the crowd? I like most anything that is presented here. I always get something from everything I hear. And um, I was thinking of maybe another talk. I might talk about a, uh, uh, five or six common substances that are medically toxic, that are fairly ubiquitous in society. That might be interesting, I think, because it would um, have applicability to a lot of people's lives.
I think one learns a lot by teaching and having to organize your thoughts to present. Thank you, Vic. Thank you, Tata. Yes, I like to hear music when I'm working. And in fact, when I was in medical school, I always played classical music uh, as I was studying. And it struck me, it may be just my brain, because a lot of people wanted absolute silence. But, um, and I would get up at four in the morning and put on headphones and listen to um, Brandenburg concertos and things like this. Uh, uh, Mozart's good. <laughs> uh, uh, really, almost anything. Uh, I, I love Brahms, uh, Brahms' Fourth Symphony, actually. Sibelius is wonderful. But it seemed to me my uh, a, a different part of my brain processed the music. I could listen to the music independently while I studied and still... And also when I would get up at four in the morning and study and be really intense. And um, that was my own pattern. Um, I, it may have been a bit unusual to wake in that early, uh, but I would study really intensely and it would seem like a couple hours had passed and I would look and it was like 15 minutes, 20 minutes had gone by. And I thought, wow, I've got tons of time left. And um, my retention seemed to be really good when I studied that way. So I guess after um, what, however many hours of sleep, I'd cleared the toxins from my brain. <laughs> and it was functioning better. That is an interesting question, Vic, about math, mathematics, music, um, uh, and there is such a pattern base uh, to music. Uh, I, when I do Sudoku pa uh, uh, puzzles, I can go really fast if I see a pattern. Oftentimes, a pattern of just it solves itself, and then some seem like it was uh, random. And it's like a chessboard. If you have a chess master, and you put the pieces on the board at random, they won't do any better than the average person uh, who might be a chess player, uh, because there's no recognizable pattern there. Uh, but the brain seems to pick up on patterns. Uh, some people's brains are more pattern oriented than others. Maybe that's it. I would say that in terms of socializing, um, I always got along better with mathematicians and uh, physicists uh, and chemists as well. Uh, although I had a few chemists that I came across who I couldn't relate to, uh, but I got along better with them than with uh, physicians.
<laughs> and no chemistry with some chemists. Yes. <laughs> they had a volatile reaction. But with a lot of physicians, I had, um, they are, I don't know, saying this is, now well, I shouldn't talk about it. They, uh, they had a different kind of background from what I had grown up in and didn't see the world at all the same as I. So I just kept my mouth shut. That's cool, Vic. Biochemistry is an immense subject. It's so cool. And so many gaps are being filled in. Thank you, CB. My pleasure. I appreciate uh, the attendance and attention that everyone gave. And the good questions. I guess I'll turn my microphone off now. Thank you, everyone.